does not happen every day and actually only once in a century to celebrate the 100th anniversary of an icon of uh, Italian design that has become part of the history, of the imagery, of the identity of, of a people like Moto Guzzi has over these uh, 100 years. Therefore, a real pleasure for me to welcome you to this talk, which is organized in cooperation with Piaggio Group in the frame of the Italian Design Day initiatives for 2021. And not only as, a, as director of the Italian Cultural Institute in Chicago, but as a writer and a Guzzi lover myself, I am really honored to uh, welcome our guests and uh, speakers. First of all, Jeffrey Schnapp. Uh, founder and faculty director of MetaLab at Harvard and faculty co-director of the Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. He holds the Pesco Solido Chair in Romance Languages and Literatures and Comparative Literature in the Faculty of Arts and Science and is a teaching faculty in the Department of Architecture at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. Besides, though, his uh, academic activity, he's a co-founder and a chief visionary officer at the Boston-based robotic company Piaggio Fast Forward. And he has curated the book Moto Guzzi 100 Years that we are so happy to present here today. Thank you, Jeffrey, for being with us. We are very happy to have you here. Greg Lynn, architect and designer, Golden Lion at the 2008 International Venice Biennale of Architecture. He is studio professor at UCLA School of Architecture and Urban Design. His work uh, is in the, uh, displayed in the permanent collections of the most important design and architectures museum in the world and is considered an innovator in redefining the medium of design uh, with digital technologies and a pioneer in the fabrication and manufacture of complex functional forms using computer numerically controlled machinery. Greg is co-founder and chief creative officer of Piaggio Fast Forward. And he has taken on now the exciting challenge of designing the new Moto Guzzi factory and museum in Mandello dell'Ario, Lake Como. And so thank you very much, Greg. We are really happy to have you with us today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Luca. A very special guest who needs no introductions whatsoever to motorbike lovers is Miguel Galluzzi, industrial designer specializing in motorcycle design. He currently heads Piaggio Advanced Design Center in Pasadena, where he manages the design of the Aprilia, Moto Guzzi, Derby, and Gilera motorcycle brands. And he works closely, of course, with the Piaggio headquarters and the R&D center centers of Piaggio. He definitely left his footprint in the history of motorbike design with the Aprilia Tuono, the Ducati Monster, the Moto Guzzi V7, V7 Racer, and the California 1400. And thanks to his project, Moto Guzzi received the Motorcycle Design Association Award in 2012 and 2013. Hello, Miguel. Thank you Hi, nice very much. Thank you very much. I would also like to welcome as well uh, Marco D'Acunzo, Chief Marketing Officer of the Piaggio Group Americas, with whom I shared from the beginning the idea of hosting this talk, and uh, Marco has contributed to making all this possible. So thank you for the job we've done together so far, Marco. Thank you. Thank you, Luca, and uh, good evening to everybody. And a warm welcome and thank for joining us today and supporting this, this event from the beginning to uh, Thomas Bozzius, Consul General of Italy in Chicago, to whom I will leave the floor in a few seconds for his uh, introductory remarks. Welcome, Thomas. I would just like to remind you all that the, this conversation is being recorded. It's being streamed live on Facebook right now, and it will be available in a few days on our YouTube uh, channel. So now let's talk about uh, the past and the future of Moto Guzzi after this long introduction. And uh, please, Consul General, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Buonasera. Good evening, everybody, and a warm thank you to all the participants to this event, celebrating the Italian Design Day. Firstly, first of all, let me say happy first 100th anniversary to Moto Guzzi. 
you look younger than you are, guys. And we really look forward to the next 100 years. I'm going very soon to leave the floor to our distinguished speakers, to whom goes my warmest thank you for having made this webinar possible. Allow me just some brief remarks to recall and to remind that this is the fifth edition of the Italian Design Day. And uh, as the previous one is organized worldwide uh, through the net of uh, consular offices and embassies of Italy around the globe under the direction, uh, of course, of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. And this year edition, let me say, is a very special one since we are celebrating the 160 years of the diplomatic relations between Italy and the United States and the 700th anniversary of the Somo Poeta Dante Alighieri, let me say somehow a pioneer of Italian modern creativity. But we have chosen to celebrate Moto Guzzi in the framework of the Italian Design Day for more than one reason. The iconic brand fully embodies the spirit and the typical features of Italian design such as the elegance and the unique beauty, a steady attention to innovation technology and industrial model strictly connected to the territory as it is the case of Mandello dell'Ario factory. All these aspects made Moto Guzzi an icon, the icon of Italian motorcycle and motorcycling, which perfectly matches what in the United States of America is the idea of travel, exploration, liberty, new frontiers. So many in close contacts that Moto Guzzi itself became a symbol of America, let me say, through movies and TV screens. Everybody recalled the motorcycles of the LA Police Department in the 70s, riding the highways on a Guzzi iconic model that was then called California. So, Moto Guzzi is synonymous of Italian design and creativity that starting local becomes global. That's why we choose Moto Guzzi and thank you all once again for this webinar. And Luca, thank you. The floor is yours again. Thank you very much, Consul. So I join also the uh, happy birthday to Moto Guzzi. Hope we'll soon be able to blow on the candles uh, somewhere, maybe in Italy in September. But before talking about that, I will leave the floor to, to Marco. And after that, to Jeffrey, uh, Miguel, and, uh, and Greg. Thank you. Thank Please. you, Luca. And, and thank you, Consul Thomas, uh, for, for the great words about uh, our love brand, Moto Guzzi. First of all, uh, I want to thank Luca uh, from the Italian uh, uh, Culture Institute for hosting this great event. It's a real honor to be here today and celebrate with all of you this incredible milestone, 100 years of uh, Moto Guzzi. I feel really proud of being part of the Moto Guzzi family, a brand that is recognized by whole bikers around the world as a key player in the motorcycle history for its evolution. Moto Guzzi, has been uh, always a pioneer in developing uh, innovative products with the best technology. The first wind tunnel gallery applied to motorcycles was built in our factory in Mandello in 1948. Uh, a revolutionary bike as the eight cylinders was a unique masterpiece at that time. The recent V85 TT, the first class in Enduro, and many other products made the uh, Hawaii Eagle brand famous and loved all around the world. We at Moto Guzzi want to celebrate these 100 years looking forward. We never stop thinking on the next innovation, how we can improve our products, uh, on how we can better serve our customers to make sure they are always happy while riding uh, our bikes. In April, we announced a special and limited collection across uh, our range uh, to celebrate the centennial year and taking inspiration from one of the most iconic bike, the Moto Guzzi eight cylinders, we design a V7 Stone Centenario, a V85 Adventure Centenario, and a V9 Bobber Centenario. Green for the sides, gray for the tank, and brown for the saddle to create this unforgettable collection. Probably some of you already saw this special collection. It's really unique and customers are loving it. In June, we also announced another important project, the new e-commerce. 
a new way to get closer to our customers, especially the young generation that are used to have their purchase experience fully digital. A unique business model that gives the possibility to easily order today a model goods from your smartphone, adding your preferred accessories, deciding if you want to go to the dealership or if you prefer to have your dream bike delivered at home. Another important innovation during the centennial year that demonstrates how Mother Guzzi looks into the future. Nobody in our industry, apart of course, uh, also our other brands as Vespa and Aprilia offers this opportunity that especially in these days create an incredible value for our customers and, uh, and dealers. Today, we present uh, the under years book that you can see here close to me a collectible uh, piece with amazing stories of incredible Gucci customers. Uh, but on this topic, uh, I will leave in a second to, uh, uh, to my friend Jeffrey to tell you more. Uh, last but not least, in September from the 6th to the 12th, uh, we will celebrate in our factory, Mandello de Lario, in Italy, the Moro Gucci World Days. Hopefully the COVID will allow us to do this uh, incredible and amazing event uh, with thousands of people joining us uh, uh, for this celebration. An event that attracts, uh, again, customers and motorcycles uh, and motorcycle enthusiasts from all over the world. Celebrating all together a milestone that only the most important brands in the world have the opportunity to achieve. And of course, many news will be announced during that time, but unfortunately, I cannot spoil any uh, any news uh, or any anticipation in this moment. So Mode Guzzi, his passion, his Italian style and design, his love for riding bikes, and we will do our best to keep having uh, our eagle flying around the world for many, many other years. I leave now the floor to Jeffrey Schnapp, who will tell you uh, more about this, uh, this beautiful uh, book. And thank you again to everybody for joining us. Thank you very much, Marco. Thanks uh, to Luca and to Consul uh, Bozios. And uh, 100 years is a really long time when we're talking about a motorcycle brand. Matchless, Vincent, Norton, BSA, Velocet, Asa. I could keep on going for a good five to 10 minutes, as my friend Miguel knows. And those are all brands that collectors dream of. Many of us grew up with those bikes, but they're not around anymore. Uh, Motoguzzi is not just around, but I think as has already been hinted, uh, is a brand that has been constantly reinventing itself over the course of a century of history. And uh, we're here just as much to talk about its present and future as we are about those hundred years that make up its, uh, its past. So the book, Motoguzzi 100 Years, is precisely not, uh, it's not a history book in the conventional sense. Um, I'm gonna switch to slides here. It is a hundred years of the evolution of the brand of the Eagle, but most of all, it's built around a series of stories, the stories of how individuals live the vehicles that shape their lives as motorcyclists, the kind of passion that informs that special relationship between a motorcycle and a, a rider, and the level of devotion that was already alluded to um, in some of the prior remarks is really something that has shaped the history of Moto Guzzi really right from the beginning and will continue to shape its future history. So uh, Moto Guzzi 100 Years, the book, is a book really built around a reflection on that history, but from the standpoint of the present, the way we're living that history, interpreting that history, making it ours and shaping it for the present and uh, for the, the future. Um, it's not a book just for collectors or for passionate uh, guzzisti. It's really a book that um, has at its core uh, precisely a series of stories, 10 stories told by authors coming from very different perspectives to the world of motorcycling um, and to the world of uh, Moto Guzzi motorcycles specifically. That span extends from uh, the lead uh, chapter, which is by the writer Melissa Holbrook Pearson. Uh, it includes a chapter by Ewan McGregor, the uh, actor, renowned actor, a chapter by my colleague Greg Lynn, uh, who will speak uh, in a moment on the subject of the 
the redevelopment of the factory area, the sort of Muraguchi campus in Mandelo. It includes a number of renowned, world-renowned journalists in the motorsports domains from Italy, from the UK, from Japan. Um, it includes an astronaut, Paolo Nespoli, the Italian astronaut who's been on three, uh, three space missions, uh, uh, talking about the relationship between um, travel in space and travel on the land and how motorcycling has um, is a key part of his own um, experience and sense of, of identity. And it concludes with a chapter um, in which I tell my own story about the California, which was already anticipated um, by a prior speaker, uh, the way in which Motoguzzi enters into the imagination of the period roughly in the 19th, late 1970s, but into the 80s and 90s, and really becomes the Harley alternative that um, embodies a certain image of the Italian motorcycle. What's extraordinary about this history is those 100 years have been built with a sense of connection to place that is absolutely unique in the world of motorcycling. Not only is every Motoguzzi product that has ever been produced, it came out of the door of the same factory in Mandelo del Lario, but the relationship of the people who worked on the production line, the designers, the engineers, uh, to the location, which is Mandela del Lario, uh, a, a, a relatively small town on the shores of uh, one of the most beautiful lakes in the world, Lake Como, that relationship to the territory has remained a constant throughout the history. And it isn't just to the terrain, it's also to the people, to the artisanal practices, the craft practices that make even a state-of-the-art industrial facility, one that's constantly informed by this dialogue, which is typical of the great success stories in the history of Italian industry between practices that belong to very deep veins of craft practice, creativity, making um, alongside state-of-the-art advances, innovation, engineering, uh, and the like. And Motoguzzi's history is really built around that, that double aspect, that double character. And that extends even to the design of its logo, which has remained pretty much identical to itself over the course of 100 years. There aren't very many brands you could say that about. The logo is the eagle that was worn by the three founders of the company when they were members of the Royal Marines. Two of them were aviators. And for, uh, for uh, 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 Carlo Guzzi, George, uh, Giovanni Ravelli, and Giorgio Parodi, the original founders, there was really no distinction between the excitement of aviation, particularly aviation as it was experienced in the battlefront of World War I, and the excitement of land speed or speed on water. In fact, uh, they chose the eagle precisely to remember uh, Ravelli who uh, perished in an accident, an aviation accident, uh, before the company could actually be established on the 15th of March, uh, uh, of 1921. Um, and throughout that history, what really characterizes what drives the engine, if you like, for Motoguzzi's own development is the development of engines. Motoguzzi, to a degree that is unequaled by any equivalent brand that survived, has produced more kinds of engines than you can possibly imagine, from one cylinders to two to four to eight. Uh, single, uh, two-stroke, uh, two four-stroke engines for uh, agricultural machinery, engines for uh, boats. It, it's really experimented with any number of different um, forms of uh, power plants. And of course, in the course of that history, right in the middle of that history, really in the 1950s, we see the emergence of the engine that has now become the icon of the brand itself, the transversal V-twin, with a shaft drive, which actually was originally developed as a prototype engine for uh, the Fiat Cinquecento to take the place of the, uh, of the Cinquecento's then power plant. It was much more powerful than the, the prior engine of the Cinquecento. It uh, had a whole series of uh, characteristics that have made it beloved to motorcyclists to this day. Its resistance over, especially um, during periods of extremely heavy use, uh, its reliability, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, at the other end of the spectrum is the Otto, 
the uh, eight cylinder dual overhead cam engine that was a 500 cc engine way ahead of its time 30 plus years maybe 40 years ahead of its time which we find on the cover of melissa holbrook's pearson's the perfect vehicle what is it about motorcycles melissa is our lead author and when she had to think of an image of what makes motorcycles such a distinctive mode of transportation she chose the auto which represents in a sense, the apex of Muraguzzi's uh, role as a leader in the performance motorcycling end of the spectrum. Even if the V, longitudinal V, which has become the icon of Muraguzzi, take, took it in another direction, its DNA was built on the racetrack. And we still have some legacies of that in products like this is the current V7, but kitted up for the uh, endurance trophy competitions that are taking place. Throughout that history, innovation is at its core. Uh, Motoguzzi is the first brand to build an air tunnel specifically dedicated to the testing of motorcycles that leads to a pioneering role in the design of uh, fairings, uh, in studying the aerodynamics of, the, uh, of motorcycles. Um, Greg, in his chapter will, uh, and in his presentation today, will talk a little bit about the factory, um, but um, I just wanted to show some of these fragments from the book in sequence, and uh, I'll get right out to the end. You can see that between the chapters where somebody tells a story, we have these um, intermezzi, these little uh, sort of uh, uh, interact um, uh, layouts, which uh, describe one or other facet of the history of Motoguzzi. In this case, Greg's chapter is introduced by uh, a, a double layout on the air, on the, uh, the, the air uh, tunnel testing facility, and then the fairings that Motoguzzi developed, which illustrate the research that was constantly going on in the area of aerodynamics. But the research also includes a lot of stuff that most people, unless you're really a hardcore Guzzi historian, are probably unaware of. Uh, the, the ways in which the brand um, uh, history includes the production of utility vehicles, uh, three wheelers of various and, uh, kinds, um, and uh, a number of other vehicle types. And here's another example of some of the legacies of this development process, the V8 TT, which is a bike that was just introduced and is currently on the market, just introduced a, a few years back and has been really a, a kind of emblem of the revitalization of the brand. The book closes with a chapter that I contributed on the story of the California, how the California became the California, essentially, how the El Dorado, which was the existing model, um, was transformed specifically for the California Highway Patrol, became the vehicle of chips, uh, which many of you are, I'm sure, are familiar with, but of course then became one of the iconic cruiser bikes uh, that has continued to have very strong and significant market throughout the world, not just with police forces, not just with military uh, forces, but with riders uh, all over the world who uh, consider the California the kind of integral embodiment of Moto Guzzi as a brand. But that history also includes some other pioneering moments. The Galetto, for example, the first large wheel sort of middleweight um, uh, motorcycle, kind of scooter motorcycle combination. Um, but of course, at the other end of the spectrum is the Otto, the eight cylinder dual overhead 500cc race bike with which Moroguzzi's racing adventures ends. And this new chapter focused on reliability, on motorcycling for the real world, not for the racetrack only, uh, takes over. Um, and uh, that's the chapter that ends with the Otto Cilindri, but also with a number of other uh, legendary motorcycles that won championship after championship, broke record after record during the course of the brand's history. So I'm gonna hand over the mic now to uh, Miguel Galuzzi um, to talk a little bit about just one example, the MGX21 of the kind of design process that goes on today, um, in a sense, in interpreting, inheriting from that um, history of invention and innovation, um, but, focusing on models for, uh, for today's markets.
Miguel, you should unmute yeah. yourself. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was talking and it usually happens. <laughs> you know, you keep the mute on and, and you keep on talking. And uh, thank, Hi, everybody. Thank you. It's a big pleasure, honor, you know, for me to be here to share this moment, which, you know, as we always say, it happens only once in a lifetime for many people. So what I wanted to show you today, and this is just to get part of the history, part of the 100th anniversary of Gutsi, is the way we've been doing the design part of the process of the development of the bikes in such a way that we were able to innovate even in that, in that aspect too. So let me open the presentation. And usually when you, you test, you do it and then it doesn't work. <laughs> As usually happens, you know, that's, that's the funny part. So I'm gonna share here. I date is installed, you see? <laughs> okay. Let me let me close this up and man. It's updating the application just at this right moment. Sorry for the delay. Don't worry, Miguel. And you test and you pre and then suddenly this happens, you know. No, I still please wait a few minutes while the update is installed. No. Then I will take the I yeah. will uh, take this opportunity because what to uh, to reconnect to a couple of things that Jeffrey was saying. Especially one, I think it's very interesting because you mentioned the, ele the element of Italian design and how Moto Guzzi embodies that. And you talked about, uh, let's say, crafts, which is, of course, uh, fundamental in a continuous innovation. But also probably this, we'll talk about that also with, um, with Greg later, the territory and the strong connection between, between a factory, a brand, a know-how, and, and the place, of course, Moto Guzzi is an example because you have many, both in the, in the world of motors, you know, from Ferrari, Ducati, you know, but also in other uh, um, hiking shoes. You know, there's a whole village where they make the best hiking shoes in the world and everyone is going there to see what happen, what will, what will be the next, you know, innovation. Yeah, if I could just add, Luca, so one of the fascinating aspects of how the company first came about, but also how it was sustained in its efforts to innovate, is its reliance on machine shops in the immediate area of Mandello. Uh, Carlo Guzzi himself, his training was, he, he didn't have formal training um, when he first started working in machine shops. It was hands-on training. It was more like an apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. And the same is true even as the company matures into the middle of the 20th century, the great um, engineers like Carcano and Todero and so forth, they often relied upon local machine shop, uh, machine shops to produce one-offs, prototypes. And it was that interplay that made Motoguzzi so much more dynamic than more traditional kinds of companies because they could they could operate on very limited scales by comparison with um, the sort of scale that a fully industrialized traditional factory mm -hmm. would require. So, so yeah, it's a crucial point. Miguel, how is the how's the uh, the updating going? Otherwise, I can ask one more question to Jeffrey. I can keep him busy. <laughs> no, I, I can I can share now. E even you know the the computers. Show me out, you know, so. <laughs> now, and the other, so the other, the other thing that came to my mind when Jeffrey was talking, especially about the, this idea of identity, I was thinking about a kind of a circular path, you know, because an Italian object, machine comes to the US and then it leaves in a way 
from an imaginary point of view, the U.S., but it lives as a U.S., as an American icon. You know, because actually, I was actually talking to several people who are not in the uh, familiar with motorbikes, and when I told them about chips, nobody knew that could even imagine that the motorbikes of chips were actually good. So that's yeah. the, such a I power. Mean it, yeah. it, I mean, it's very striking how you know basic the basic design of the California was an El Dorado that was modified specifically to meet the requirements of the California Highway Patrol, and American law imposed open competitions between makers. So Harley couldn't be the only submitter to any to one of these public competitions. And it was it was two um, uh, two Hungarian um, immigrants from New York who had no particular knowledge of motorcycles who when they saw the El Dorado, they said, this is the the Harley killer. <laughs> you know, this is this is the bike that could compete. And so they went to Mandelo and they looked at the El Dorado and they said, well, here are the requirements for the competition. And there were a couple of things that had to be done and they created uh, three prototype Californias, the very first California, shipped them to Los Angeles, presented them to the Los Angeles uh, representatives of the California Highway Patrol. And they said, perfect, uh, we'll order 150. <laughs> and, and that was the beginning. And from that moment, once they started appearing in the streets, the, the public became fascinated by them. They became this, you know, very, you know, kind of um, uh, a sort of seductive uh, uh, image of the highway patrol itself. And uh, cu the customer base started expanding. Sean Connery, when he was shooting one of the Bond films, insisted on being shot sitting on one of the California Highway Patrol California models. And Marlon Brando, similarly. So the myth begins to get um, to develop, to flourish, and then it, it gets exported, precisely as you hinted. It gets exported all over the world as, um, in a sense, the, the very essence of, of this product that came out of Mandelo del Lario, out of this little town on the shores of Lake Como. Thank you, Jeffrey. And I think the app, I see the, I see the file being shared by, by Miguel. So uh... I think we, we, we got the application working. Now all the right. update is done. We we have so, so many well, experts in robotics here, and we are still struggling with uh, PDF. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, you were always looking ahead, but sometimes, you know, the little details are the ones that put you. Okay, what I wanted to tell you today, and this is something very significant for us in the design department of, Mo of Piaggio, Moto Guzzi, Aprilia, is that we are always pushing our way. We decide what to do. Uh, in many ways. And this is the story, and this is 2014. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of our design process and the way we are doing it, we've been doing it for the last eight, 10 years, that is allowing to us to not only accelerate the process of the decision making of a new product, but also to decide very clearly what's the direction we are taking. This, as you can see, these are all digital models. And I usually like to show this and people said, okay, are we gonna look at the bikes? And no, no, this doesn't exist. Exist in a virtual world. And as you can see here, there is a little cube in the front of the wheel, which allow us to understand the position in the space when we share some files. But this allow us today, the technology, and this is you know, part of the history of pushing ahead you know, every year, that allow us to decide, and this was, I think, in October 2014, and we were deciding for a prototype to bring into the Milan show in November 2014. We had the engine, we have the California, this is based on the California, as we were talking before, but we needed to do something more, something that inspires speed, something that is gonna be the iconic moment in which, you know, we were getting closer to the centenary, centennial. So this model one, the inspiration was the speed. And as you can see here, we went from that sketch that is a completely digital thing that doesn't stick anywhere to this model, which is already files, mathematical files that were milled or 3D printed. And we put together the prototype 
And mainly we work like it would be clay, like it used to be 15, 20 years ago. These little points are the pieces of the shape we have that we move and we create pieces that then become 3D printed parts that could be put together in any kind, in any part of the world. That's the other aspect that we've been able to do. We are in California. We usually work during the day for us, which is the night in Italy. We send the files during our night. Then the engineers on the other side of the, 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 the sea get the files, do whatever they want, and they will start putting together the, the, the prototype. So here, for example, between engineering and design is a continuous collaboration with video, having the application updated correctly, having the video and changing, modifying, just like we would do with a little piece of paper and a pen. So this, for example, is already an engineering drawing, which is a more defined and more clear situation that we had at the beginning. And we even think, you know, the way we manufacture the bikes. This was one of the considerations because of the assembly line has a specific dimension that needs to clear the muffler because the muffler is put before that the bike, you know, moves in a certain moment. So all these things could be looked like, for example, we invented these lights of LEDs, you know, very long that will allow us to turn them on and even get into to the prototype very fast and see what would happen with the lights. As you can see, this is a very, very rough prototype because you see the surfaces are really, really not nice. And this was, this is the funny part because I was in New York at that time, I think it was October, end of October, I was in a hotel and we were discussing in the morning, you know, a few other parts and I got to the hotel, at, at, I think it was after dinner and, and we, I was changing some files, send them to, to Italy and we were modifying during that week and I got to, the, to Noale, this is in, in Italy, the model shop for the design department in Noale and we started putting together the prototype for the, the show. We got the pictures, you know, we just, you know, just in time. And we were able to show the bike in Enigma 2014 after a rush, like in a month and a half, putting together a bike that in two, in two months before didn't exist. So the technology we have today allow us to do many things that before it would take, you know, I was thinking today, looking at these pictures, you know, when I got into the industry like 35 years ago, everything was done by hand. Even the dice would be copied from a piece of wood and it would be made, you know, with a milling machine, just copying the little piece. Today, the tools, the computers, the capacity we have are amazing. We are able to do incredible stuff that again, allow us for us, for example, to have an office in Pasadena that works, you know, in the hours that everybody sleep and we always work in almost 24 hours a day because we are, you know, the difference in hours, but we can be in any part of the world. The COVID, the, the virus allow us even, you know, more to understand what's the possibility of being or the technology we have available. In the meantime, we were showing that bike. We had a prototype made, and this is the ones that usually run around the street, you know, that are, that are covered so people don't see, you know, what the bike we have. And this was the first bike that went into, into production in Mandelo. For me, as a designer, we end up going in 2016 to Sturgis, which is one of the biggest rallies for Harley Davidson's in the war, people would see us and would stop us in the street and ask us, but how were you able to turn the engine around? That's not possible because they didn't recognize that it was a Gucci because Gucci has the engine coming, coming you know, the other way around. So for most people that have Harleys, Gucci's are not possible to make. And this was a magazine in California that showed, you know, that was their article with Darth Vader going around California. But again, my point right now is we are in a hundredth anniversary of Gucci. We are going to get together in September 
fingers crossed, for the new chapter of another hundred years that we are having you know, many, many ideas to show what the next future could be. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Uh, then now we'll, I will take the, again the opportunity. Now we introduce this as um, I take the liberty of of of, man, of uh, jumping in, since we, uh, Miguel was was talking about um, design and and um, the future as a designer. And of course, Motoguzzi has a very very uh, strong uh, identity also in terms of design. If you think about the tank of the V7, you know, or uh, exactly the the V the the, the V the V mod the V engine. So as a designer, how do you um, how do you uh, you deal this relationship between you know the, the the pleasure and the desire of changing and making new things, but also in a way the beautiful constraint of having this this tradition behind you. Uh, uh, Gucci has an advantage, and as I said, you know before, the engine and its many any motorcycle is the heart of the vehicle. So for us, any any kind of thinking starts from the engine. As as you can see, the California was. The last California, the MGX21, is the engine that is pushing through the gas tank. So the gas tank is not an element as important as many other brands, but it's the engine that is pushing through the, the gas tank, being the number one element in the design uh, process. Then there is an aspect of tradition. The tradition is also important, but we always, again, for example, the bikes are like, for example, we are working right now in the world of the classics, mostly. But the way we do the stuff is extremely ahead of everybody else. Because something that I show you right now, you know, as a process, is something that Gucci was doing, as I said, 10 years ago, before everybody else. And shorting the process in such a way that we were able to have many possibilities, instead of going one direction and then figure out, oh, that's wrong. Then we have to start again. No, this technology allows us to do maybe three, five full sizes, and then say, yeah, that's the right one. So because the time is being has been shortened, you know, very, very much. And one more one more thing um, that I would like you to share with with our audience, which is quite uh, unique what you told us uh, before we, we went live here. Of course, we know that Motoguzzi was innovating in in, um, in the project phase, in the design phase. It's, they've been always innovating in that in that part of the of the yeah. design. Yeah. So, and also the the famous wind gallery that was built in Mandello, the Lario, no, was was one of the first, probably. No, no, it was it was the first. It, it was, was the first, the first the, wind gallery mm -hmm. in the war of motorcycling. It was the first. Not even Japanese at the times that were racing. They were very afraid that Gucci was doing too well because of the wind tunnel. But the story is very funny because I remember going for the first time to the factory and meeting all, all people that used to work. And we went, you know, I wanted to see the mythical wind tunnel. So he took, they took me, you know, to see the wind tunnel. And they said, you know, this was 1948. You know, we started it in 1949, the story, but it was so unique that every time that we needed to start the wind tunnel, we would have to show in town a sign that says, we are gonna start the wind tunnel from three to five. You may not have electricity at the time because it has a huge, and they would turn it on and the town would, would go out, out of lights. <laughs> but because it was, you know, the company, I mean, the company is the town, everybody would be happy about it. They would get their candles and wait, you know, for the electricity yeah. to come back. So, and again, this way we go back to the territory. So I will leave it to Jeffrey and, and Greg to, uh, to, to elaborate about that, so. Sure. Well, so, <clears throat> I mean, I'll, I'll be brief, but the, the, the factory and the future of the factory, it was a really amazing experience for me. And I would contextualize it and say that in the past, I've done a lot of work with Italian companies like uh, the houseware manufacturer Alessi in Crucinalo, 
um, with Permastelisa, with their innovations in building construction, and also at all of the Salone um, events, they happen in Italy because you can make a prototype of a piece of furniture in virtually any material in Italy very quickly. And everything Miguel is saying is absolutely true. Um, I remember working with Alessi and I said, well, you're a metals company and I would love to make a coffee pot that's made of explosion formed titanium. And they said, oh, we know the people doing explosion form titanium. <laughs> We've even played around with that material. So there's always a knowledge of material, but more than anything, a desire for innovation that I think is not understood by most people. I think um, Italy and the territory is often thought of in terms of food or produce or wine or things like that. But actually the, the innovation that happens around design and manufacture that connect those things is, is very real. And for me, maybe uh, you know, digital software that was being invented in the United States was kind of hitting the ground with real materials and real construction in Italy. And that's always been a, a, a kind of experience of mine. So I was with Jeffrey and Miguel and we were in Milan and it came up with the Piaggio group. Oh, well, we have this Motoguzzi factory up on Lake Como that's a 40 minute drive away. And I was just like, what? You know, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. And, and I said, well, so when can we go? And they said, oh, you'd be interested in going? And I said, what are you joking? So the next morning I was on a train and got out at the station on the lake and there was the Motoguzzi rowing club on my left on the lake. And there was the Motoguzzi red door with the eagle on the right. And I walked in and had a tour first of the inventory and then of the engine assembly plant and saw the engines being tested. And it was amazing to see these racks of engines waiting to meet their, their chassis and bikes. Then went to the final assembly plant um, and then came back and got a tour of a museum of hundreds of historic Motoguzzi bikes where the person that took us through the museum was a person that had worked at Motoguzzi from the time he was a teenager. And he wasn't a hundred years old, but he had to be close to a hundred years old. Um, and he knew everything about every bike and every contraption we saw. And, um, and then we went down and we saw actually the very bike that Miguel showed us. We saw some of those prototypes in a big historic hall, which was used for staging and, and building these custom vehicles. And I remember then the, the owners of the company turning to me and saying, well, so we're thinking of building a new engine plant. Like, well, how would you think about designing it? And I, I said, I would think about designing it the way I just had an experience. You should open this up and it let people come in and look at the inventory and look at the engine plant and see the final assembly and go through the museum and have this experience of the manufacture and prototyping and innovation and restoration and care of the legacy and this incredible experience I had. Um, and then by the way, I got in a boat, a little motoscafo and, and went 20 minutes on the lake around Bellagio back to the train station to go back to Milan. I mean, it, I've been to a lot of factories in a lot of countries in my life. I've never had an experience of the Motoguzzi factory um, it, at that level. And now I've been back a bunch of times and the natural landscape there, the, I have to assume the, the riding conditions and the proximity to both racing tracks and mountain roads and lakefront um, streets. I mean, it's an incredible place to ride a motorcycle as well, by the way. It's a kind of a, an automatic as an architect. You really just have to get out of the way and let somebody have an experience of the, of the place. It's really amazing. Um, I mean, so for, for us, I mean, what we're doing 
is really just giving a space to invite the public in. And whether it's someone who wants to bring their historic bike or someone who wants to see the motorcycles that are not yet available in the showrooms, um, it's just a, an incredible experience to have. And to have it on Lake Como, which is a beautiful place, as Jeffrey said, but like all beautiful places, you're always wondering, like, what am I supposed to do here? You get to go visit a place where they're making the California motorcycles from, from chips in Los Angeles. You find it right outside of Milan. So it's, um, for us, it's a really exciting thing to be involved with, um, both protecting the legacy with all of the existing buildings and the patrimony and adaptively reusing some of those things for restaurants and the museums and, and labs and places to, to see the historic aspect and then state-of-the-art construction with access that people would normally not have to a factory where they can actually see a bike that they could buy in the showroom being assembled and tested and um, designed even and prototyped. So it's, it's, a, it's a really great thing. It's so many brands could have looked at that and said, well, we're going to move our production offshore or we're going to um, just simply assemble parts from someplace else here. But I mean, you're seeing engines being put together and blocks being tested and all these things right there. I think it's a very smart thing to, to try to hold this legacy of innovation and push it forward and to push it forward in a consolidated way in Italy. Um, because there are resources there, there just aren't other places. And it, it's going to have a big impact on the future of the company and the bikes as well. But so, I mean, for me, I think that, um, you know, really the, the whole approach to Italian design and culture and the, the brand is to, to let people discover their own stories uh, for themselves, like I had, like getting that tour and trying to make it accessible for people both that are aficionados and passionate about the brand. And, you know, in September at Guzzi Days, I'm sure those people that make the pilgrimage to Mandela Delario, it's for them. But frankly, it's also for that person that doesn't know anything about motorcycles, but who might find themselves on Lake Como and get a tour and discover that there's this, this legacy of innovation and state-of-the-art manufacturing all happening in this place, which most people don't know, Italy really is known for that. And, and it's a story that Italy doesn't tell about itself so much, the story of manufacturing innovations and technological innovations. It's really at the heart of why there are so many high-performance brands all in that neighborhood. Thank you, thank you, Greg. And jumping in again because you know it seems that I'm insisting on this territorial uh, issue, but in a way you 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 um, you brought it up to my attention again. And we talked about innovation, we talked about beautiful lines, uh, but there's also a question that I think is crucial in terms of quality, because you you talked about this guy who led you through the museum that has been work had worked all his life in the good see factories and i think probably the the idea of keeping the factory where where it's always been with the same people and families who had been working in the in the um, in the labs and in the <clears throat> in the plant contribute to the to the quality of the of the of the manufacture or the result itself what, what do you think guys well absolutely and and by the way it's um the the pride but also the the will to improvement and to the next thing is is very important i mean i've been a lot of places where they'll have four thousand engineers in an organization and it just immobilizes you because you can't do anything i mean um there are some car companies i know in germany where if you want to do something new you have to go to Singapore to do it quietly because otherwise 4,000 engineers kill every idea. Whereas at Moda Guzzi, the engineers are always open to something new. And it's, you know, the experience of going through the, the 
legacy bikes of, you know, eight cylinder and three cylinder and one cylinder, two cylinder, four strokes and two strokes. It was amazing that they didn't settle on what was the right engine, at least in the tour that I had. And there was always an openness to, yeah, we could do things better, you know, rather than we know how to do everything. It was always, let's think about how to do it better. And I think that's very much the culture of the company and the culture of the place. So it's, it's important to plug into that and, and cultivate it. Yeah, I, I, think, I think also the, in my experience is the next challenge that is important. And I think as Greg was saying, this is something Italians have that is not very well known in around the world that you have achieved something, but then you are already thinking ahead for the next one. And this has been my history in the motorcycle world. We were always looking for the next thing, whatever was that, you know, and it's always important. It's just a matter of keeping you know, the thing going, which in my experience, and I work with other manufacturers too, is not, is not easy to find. And that's make, you know, the Italian industry, like for example, in this case, Moto Guzzi, unique. I see. Jeffrey, what do you think? You were, I saw you nodding and as a historian of culture. Yeah, I think um, some of the agility and nimbleness that, that both Miguel and Greg were alluding to that comes from this unique dynamic of the local and the global um, has really been uh, central to the history of innovation at Moto Guzzi. Um, the ability, as Greg mentioned, to continue to experiment with motor types, even after Carcano's longitudinal V-twin became the iconic engine for most Moto Guzzi motorcycles, there, there are still the, uh, tw uh, various uh, two-cylinder parallel twins, type engine designs. There were two-stroke engines. There were 350s for the Galetto, for example. And, uh, that's the kind of variety that you can only allow yourself if you operate on a certain scale and with a certain design. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, and that, that has continued to be part of the history. And I think it explains also almost the tribal-like loyalty of the hardcore Gutsisti to the brand. Even during the years of challenges and difficulties, you know, um, there's a sense of intergenerational connection um, that uh, I think is just part of the DNA of the company and the brand, um, and that's uh, that that continues to be to be present even in this world where, as Miguel was suggesting, designs are you know flying over the airwaves, so to speak, being modified on the fly, being you know sort of 3D printed, tested out. Um, and where we have this sense of the local, but it's now the local that in a hyper-connected world where, um, where everything is um, both local and global at the same time. Uh, and I think that's the big challenge for the company in, in the future as well, is um, being a player on that stage, which is a really big stage, um, while maintaining a kind of uh, rootedness in what has enriched and nourished and fed the development of Moto Guzzi over the course of this 100 years. Um, okay. Yeah, the Thank other you. thing I would add, mm -hmm. and last thing, please, please go, is that Moto Guzzi is one of the only brands that is still made in Mandel, in, made in Italy, in Mandelo del Lario, and as Greg was saying, for 100 years, it never moved from there, and we are yeah. still there, and we are just looking to another 100 years there. And again, today in the, in the world we live in, in which you know, manufacturers go to many places to manufacture, Moto Guzzi are made there, Mont Mandelo de Laria. Yeah, we design it here and there, but at the end of the day, they are put together there. And also there most, is, most yeah. components, no, I think are made. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, from... yeah. I, I mean, there are certain elements that come from yeah. Brembo made there, sure. but the bike <clears throat> is made in Italy. Yeah. which today is a unique proposition in the world we are living in. Yeah, there's there's yeah, never been a motorcycle with the Moto Guzzi badge that wasn't 
didn't roll down the, 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 the line of the production line in Mandelo de la Rio yeah. ever. Yeah. <laughs> And this is a strong point for, uh, for, for our customers and for our brand. Having uh, the made in Italy as a strong value, as a selling proposition is something that it's really appreciated by our, our consumers and, and customers. Uh, uh, we, we touched base many, many points, but I think uh, who had the opportunity of uh, visiting uh, uh, the Mother Guzzi factory and the museum can really understand uh, what Moda Guzzi did in his history, because uh, looking at the, uh, the diversity of products that we created and what we are still creating as of now, it's, it's really unbelievable. And uh, uh, what we are saying now that the production, having the production there, uh, today we are fighting in the business because we are in a very complex industry and we have players coming in from all over the world without mentioning our competitors, but uh, they are coming into the market with very strong proposition, uh, a very strong uh, sales price, uh, but we strongly believe on uh, building a value around our products and around our brands and uh, having uh, uh, every Mother Guzzi manufacturer in Mandelo del Lario, it's, uh, it's something unique. It's a value that our customers really uh, recognize uh, and are happy to, uh, to, to still seeing uh, in our motorcycles. And as you mentioned, uh, we all, I think we have been luring our public about the, our audience about uh, coming to Mandello. And so we are not only doing some uh, promotion of Italian know-how and design, but also let's promote some tourism to Italy. Because there are a few uh, friends here that are asking if uh, it's possible to visit the factory uh, and, the mu and the museum. And I would also ask Marco probably to take this opportunity to tell us what's, what will happen uh, in September, uh, I think from the 6th to the 12th of September sure. for these uh, Guzzi World Days. So we could organize a, a group, a from, a group from, to, <laughs> from Chicago. Yeah, absolutely. The, the factory as of now, unfortunately, due to COVID, it cannot be visited in these days but we are expecting to be fully reopened uh, for the great opportunity and the great moment uh, uh, in September for the World Days of Mother Guzzi, uh, where we will have a huge event. We will present, as I mentioned in my speech, uh, many, many news. Unfortunately, we cannot provide many anticipation, but we will have uh, a lot of things, uh, a lot of uh, uh, new aspects coming out uh, to look in the future of, of Mother Guzzi. And in that occasion, for sure, we will have the opportunity of, uh, of visiting the museum, of visiting the factory to really understand uh, the experience that Greg uh, had the pleasure to, to add uh, and uh, having uh, uh, the opportunity to see with your eyes uh, the beauty of uh, this factory that, as we said, uh, is in a, an amazing place. So you are all welcome to, to join us from the 6th to the 12th. On our website, you will see all the details coming out in the next, uh, in the next uh, weeks and, and months, uh, where hopefully the COVID will allow us uh, to host uh, this beautiful event. And again, you will, uh, you will be happy to see many big news uh, coming out from, uh, from Mother Guzzi. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. As the last, really last thing, uh, it would be nice to keep this conversation going on forever because there are many questions and uh, things that I would like to ask you guys, but we need to close. So I would like, as we talked about generations, about culture, about tradition and innovation, I would just like to, to let everyone know that there's this uh, young rider from Illinois, he's 22 years old, and is taking part to the um, cross country motorcycle chase, which is a one week long uh, motorbike race that goes, I think, from Missouri to down to Florida. And he is riding, he's racing on a Moto Guzzi Falcone from 1950 that has been prepared by another Moto Guzzi lover that goes under the name of the, the Guzzi Doctor here near Chicago. And so uh, I would invite everyone to keep fingers crossed and uh, wish a safe race to Max Lynch. Actually, you can follow him on Instagram because he's uh, giving daily updates about how the race is going. So uh, good That's luck to great. him and to his Falcone.
and we love to see this young generation still riding uh, our Moto Guzzi bikes. All right, guys, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a very interesting and stimulating conversation. Uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll uh, be able to celebrate and uh, organize some other events uh, throughout this year because it's, a, it's an anniversary that uh, is worth celebrating all over the year. So thank you, and I hope to see you and hear from you again very soon. Thank you, thank you, Luca. Thank you. And of course, uh, happy birthday, Moto Guzzi. Happy birthday. <laughs> Buon compleanno. Buon, Buon compleanno, Moto Guzzi. <laughs> grazie, grazie. Bye. Thank you, Luca. Bye. Ciao.